morning, my name's Anna and I'm a member here at Morelands Church and we're going to read from God's Word now and it's from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 11 to 27. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten miners. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit, so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his miner away from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. Sir, they replied, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Good morning, everyone. As we begin this morning, I want to see if you can spot the odd one out from these four activities. Skydiving, playing chess, tombstoning and waiting. I'll give you a moment to think about that and discuss it. But what did he go for? The correct answer, or at least the answer I was hoping for, is chess. Because all of the other three involve risk. In the cases of skydiving and tombstoning, that's really very obvious. Both of these activities involve flinging yourself through the air. But waiting, that doesn't immediately stand out as a risky activity. But I think waiting can actually be an enormously high risk activity. Now waiting is risky because the act of waiting is the choice to say no to something because you believe that there is something better coming. Now we're not very good at this in our world, are we? We suffer far too much from the fear of missing out to wait well. We find it hard to have the confidence that something is worth waiting for. You have to be really convinced that the future prospect is better and worth the risk, cost and sacrifice of waiting for it. And that is what our passage is all about this morning. This morning, we're going to be looking at a parable that is all about waiting. It's going to show us two things particularly, what it looks like to wait well and what it looks like to wait badly. Like a few of the parables in Luke, this one begins with a description of the setting of the parable. And it's very clearly told to help us understand what's going on and what the parable is all about. That's in verse 11. Let me read that again for us from our passage this morning. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Jesus is approaching Jerusalem and people think that the kingdom of God is going to appear at once. 
Jesus' approach to Jerusalem has been a major theme in Luke ever since chapter 9 verse 51 when Jesus resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. The whole narrative of Luke has been on the road to Jerusalem. We've moved steadily closer and closer and now we are nearly there. For Jesus' followers, the expectation is that the kingdom of God would come immediately. By this, they mean that they would expect Jesus to be crowned king as soon as he walked uh, through the Jerusalem gates, bringing in a brilliant new world free from Roman occupation. Now, this has been the great hope of the Jewish people for centuries, and it looked like Jesus would have been the king to achieve this. That's what they'd have expected about the kingdom of God. And if you just flick over a page in your Bible, you'll see that very clearly uh, as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. That's what they expected from him. So we need to see as we begin that Jesus wants to change people's expectations. He's going to explain something about how the kingdom of God is going to come. And from these, this very first verse, we can already see that's to do with timing. The people think the kingdom is going to come immediately. This parable is going to correct that thinking. This parable is going to introduce the idea of waiting. Now, this would have been a huge surprise to the first hearers who were ready for this kingdom to appear as soon as Jesus set foot in Jerusalem. But for us, this idea might not be quite the surprise of those first hearers. We're well aware that Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem didn't change everything about how our world feels here and now. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'll know that we're waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So whilst this might not be a shock, I do think this is a really important parable for us to listen to because it's all about right now. It's going to show us just what it will mean to wait well for this kingdom and what that means might surprise you. And if you're just tuning in this morning and you aren't sure about Jesus, the kingdom of God and this whole Christianity thing, then let me encourage you to listen. Listen into this parable as we learn it together. It's going to expose some great truths and some very, very hard truths about the world that we're in. And it's going to show us how to live rightly in the light of the future. So please keep listening as we begin our first point on the outline, waiting well waiting well verses 12 to 19. The parable opens uh, with a great deal of scene setting. These uh, first few verses tell us a lot of story very quickly. We begin with a nobleman who has to travel away to a distant land to be crowned king and then he can return and assume his rule as the king. This country is described as distant and it's obviously going to take an unknown but we presume kind of lengthy time to get there and back. Whilst uh, the nobleman is gone, he leaves ten of his servants to work for him and he gives them each a minor, now that's about three months wages, and he instructs them to put it to work, use it in business, invest it in some way until he returns and then off he goes. Now the servants have to go away and go about their master's business. They don't know when he'll return and they won't really have any warning that he's coming either. There's no uh, GPS, there's no flight tracking, and the journey would have taken a, a long, long time. So his servants are really left to their own devices, waiting well. Uh, for them, it's going to mean uh, working this money, earning a profit, just as they've been instructed to do, listening to their master's words and going about his business. But that's not going to be easy. Verse 14 tells us, but his subjects hated him and they sent a delegation after him to say we don't want this man to be our king. This detail throws a huge layer of uncertainty into the mix. The people of the land where the nobleman will eventually become king hate him. They don't want him to be king and they obviously feel very strongly about this uh, and they feel strongly enough to chase after him the long long way to this distant faraway country to put forward their case whichever higher power is able to make him king. They really, really don't want him to be king over them. And now there is an uncertainty for the servants. They're left kind of questioning whether or not the king really will become king. The people all around them have rejected the nobleman's kingship and they are living in the hope that he won't be king. 
They're actively beginning to work against his impending rule. And so the servants have a choice. They can either listen to the subjects who hate the king, or they can trust the king and continue to work for him as instructed, not knowing uh, when or, or even if he will return as king as he's promised. And here's the risk that they face as they wait. There is a great risk in the choice they make. If they choose to work for the king, they might miss out on their own wealth. and They might be reviled and rejected by their fellow countrymen as one who serves the king when everyone else hates them. They're going to be pouring years of their lives into the work of a king who might not return. Which leaves us, as the readers, wondering what the servants will do. Will they wait well for the king, working for the investment he has given them? trusting in him to return in spite of all the opposition around them or will they reject the king give up on his investment and turn to live their lives for their own pursuits can they wait well and this really is the question for us as well reading the passage today the parable will continue but the global story stops here as we've already thought you see the nobleman in the story is jesus he's gone away for a time, but will return to bring the kingdom of God. Remember the context of this parable. Jesus is telling it to people who think the kingdom of God is going to come at once. They need to understand that there is this gap. Jesus proceeded to Jerusalem. He died on the cross. He secured the kingdom. But now there is a time of waiting for his kingdom to be revealed. Much like the nobleman, the answer is decided, but the reality of his rule is not yet known. So we are left with the question of how we will live, just as the servants in this parable are left with that question. We are left asking, will we be faithful and serve the king, trusting in his return, even though that is risky? Or will we listen to the world around us, a world that is full of people who reject Jesus as king, who don't want him to be king, and who actively go out of their way to stop him being king? Whilst we wait for the king, we aren't sure who's right, are we? The king or the subjects? We have the king's word that he will return. And so we must choose either to trust it or trust the words of those around us. Now, waiting is not easy. It is definitely risky. Waiting for the king will mean saying no to a great many things. If we're going to wait well, if we're going to wait faithfully, then we're going to need to know that it's going to be worth it in the end which is just what the parable will show us next in the results. We begin to see the results in verse 15 as the story plays out very quickly. The journey there and back again passes in a flash and the noble one is declared to be king. He returns home and his first order of business is to find out what his servants have been up to. Have they waited faithfully for him? Have they trusted that he will return? So he calls for his servants to see how they've been getting on whilst he's been away. And we'll pick up the story in verse 16. It says, The first one came and said, Sir, your miner has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Wow. The first servant has kept his faith in the king and has achieved incredible yields with the miner he has been given. The king's return has made a 1000% return. And the king is understandably thrilled with the servant. Look at his reply. He says, well done, my good servant. What a mark of praise for the servant to hear. And notice particularly what the servant is praised for. It's not his skill in business, which is obviously great, uh, but for his faithfulness. He is praised because he is trustworthy. He has maintained his confidence in the king throughout his journey, and he is to be rewarded. And that reward is, is great, isn't it? It's excessive and it's a bit surprising. We might expect that the servant would be given a share of his hard work, some of the money, or some kind of honorary title by the king, you know, a knighthood or, or an earldom to show he's a faithful servant, perhaps either of those followed by a life of luxury in the palace. But what he's actually given is the charge of 10 cities. Not a life of luxury or an expensive gift, but more responsibility. Having proved himself to be trustworthy and capable of holding responsibility, 
he is given more. The king wants this man to continue to serve him. Now this responsibility ensures that the servant will remain in relationship with the king and will have the privilege of working with him in running his kingdom. And that's the real reward here. He has relationship with and the trust of the king. Now the second servant comes forward and he has made five miners. Another great result, 500% return. Not as much as the first servant, but still very, very good. And so he is given charge of five cities. We see here that the king is a very fair man. He has rewarded both men according to their work and both have been generously rewarded. But the one who achieved more has been given more. Their faithful service with the king's investment has led to a generous reward. Now these servants, they didn't have any idea what their reward would be when the king returned. They simply kept serving as they were faithful to the king. We, on the other hand, are given an indication of the reward of maintaining our own faithfulness in this parable. And that reward is simply incredible. The servants in this parable are given responsibility and relationship with the king in return for their faithful service whilst he was away. And in much the same way, if we are faithful to King Jesus, we can expect responsibility and relationship with him for eternity. This, like the reward the servants received, might seem somewhat unexpected. Our our world tells us uh, all kinds of different stories of heaven or reward or joy, but very rarely that work and responsibility are a reward worth searching for. But this is a, a real deep truth. Mankind was made to work. Though our work now is hard and toilsome, there is inherent goodness to work that will last. Faithful service of the king now will lead to joyful responsibility in his presence forever. There's something we can relate to there, isn't there? We all know the joy it is when someone who we respect considers us trustworthy, when the boss or the teacher gives us something important to do. It evidences the relationship that exists. It shows us that hard work and diligence has been noticed. There's a real rightness to that feeling. This trustworthy responsibility is the end result for the servants in this parable, and it is a reward for those who patiently wait for Jesus. They've waited well, they've waited faithfully. They've risked it by saying no and held on to their confidence in the king, and that risk has been worth it. It's just the same for you if you are a Christian this morning. Hold on to your confidence in Jesus, no matter how big a risk that may seem, and he will reward you with relationship and responsibility with him for eternity. Our passage, however, does not end there. We have to be introduced uh, to one more servant, and sadly, he's going to show us the complete opposite of the first two. He is faithless, and he has waited badly whilst the king has been away. And we meet him in verses 20 and 21. Let me read those. They say, Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you do not put in and you reap what you did not sow. On first glance, the attitude of this third servant, it doesn't actually seem that bad. There's a degree to which it seems that he still has waited faithfully for the king to return. After all, he's returned the original investment intact with no loss for any reason. No harm, no foul, we might say. Investing money is an inherently risky business. Better to keep it safe for the king to return, surely. And besides, if he'd lost that money, the king might ask him to make it up out of his own pocket. So easier just to keep it safe, avoid the risk, return it to the king. After he's not kind of spent it or swindled it or anything, he's not done anything wrong here, has he? Well, the problem is that he's not done anything right either. The king clearly knew the risks when he gave the money to the servants. He would have known that his money would potentially be lost as the servants went about business. But he told them to put it to work. By simply keeping the money safe, the third servant has actually rejected the king's command. The king told him to put the money to work and he refused. And when we look closely at what he says about the king, it doesn't get any better. He describes him as a hard man 
taking out what he does not put in and reaping what he does not sow? Well, in the first instance, these words are undeniably false, as a king has actually put the initial deposit down. He has sown the seed and commanded the servants to work it. So the servant is wrong here. And really, these words betray the servant's true feelings. He doesn't want to work for the king. He doesn't want the king to receive the benefit of his hard work. The servant wants to work for himself. And so he simply does not work for the king. Yet he's still afraid of the king. He's not ready to kind of outrightly defy him or reject him by keeping the minor for himself or joining in with the delegation who reject his rule. So he kind of keeps it safe, wraps it in his hanky and puts it on a shelf for safekeeping. His rejection of the king is subtle, but it is rejection nonetheless. The king, however, sees straight through the servant's words and gives him his response in the very next verses. Let's look at what he says there. He says, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I do not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? The king unpacks the servant's rejection swiftly and he shows the servant's true heart. At the very least, the servant could have gone down to the bank and deposited the money where the money would have earned interest over the time and that could have been collected, rather than just sitting on a shelf gathering dust. If he really thought the king didn't deserve his work, then that would have brought some small return on the investment. But his attitude to the king has denied even that. He is judged by his own words that reveal that his motivation isn't truly a fear of doing wrong and losing money, it's actually rejection of the king himself. He has willfully chosen to ignore the king's command and has lazily left the miner on the shelf. It's not that he has denied the king that the king will return. It's just that he doesn't consider the king worth working for. He doesn't consider it worth the risk to serve him in the face of the opposition around him. Ultimately, he is choosing here to side with the enemies that hate the king. It appears that he has believed their words rather than the words that the king spoke. There's a clear warning here, isn't there? Where the first servants show that faithful waiting um, looks like patient and diligent work, yielding joyful rewards. This this third servant, he shows us the danger of half-heartedness. He's tried to live with a foot in both camps. He's kind of kept his minor as an insurance policy in case the king does return, but he's lived his life as if he won't. He's not waited faithfully, waiting and working every day, expecting the king to return. The king has made no difference to his life, except for a small bit of his shelf that he can't use because it's got a a miner wrapped in cloth on it. Sure, if somebody asked him what that bundle was, he, he might have told them. But there'd have been no way anyone would have known of his relationship with the king otherwise. It just didn't make a difference to his life. And that is a warning we must listen to. That is how so many of us can often treat Jesus, as an optional extra. Sure, we might know the gospel, we might even go to church on occasion, but we're not really working for him. Our lives aren't lived in the expectation of his return. We aren't waiting and and working and taking risks inherent in that. It's very easy to live with a foot in both worlds and slip into faithlessness, living for today with Jesus as the great eternal insurance policy. And the next verses show us why that is just so dangerous as we see the results. The king begins by declaring that the one minor that the servant presents will be taken away from him and given to the one who has ten. The courtroom of the king is shocked at this. They say it. How can he give it? To the one who has ten, it's like some kind of reverse Robin Hood, taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Seems completely out of character from the king, as we've come to see him so far. And the king responds by laying down an extraordinary truth. Look down at verse 26. It says, he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, 
even what they have will be taken away. Now this verse really is the key to the whole passage. Let me read it again. It says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. We see this verse illustrated as the king takes the miner from the third servant and gives it to the first. These words are striking, aren't they? The third servant loses everything, whereas the first servant gains more and more and more. This is not just the loss of a miner for the third servant. It is the complete loss of relationship with the king too. Where the first two servants were rewarded with responsibility and relationship, the third loses what little relationship he had. And now he is as good as the enemies who have rejected the king initially. He has lost all hope of relationship with the king. The possibility for relationship has been right there, just in front of him. All he had to do was listen to the instruction he was given and make the most of the investment. But he's chosen not to. And now it is too late. The miner has been taken from him and his relationship with the king is in tatters. This faithless waiting leads to the servant losing what little he had. He did not trust the king. He did not consider him worth the risk. And so he is now in real danger. His insurance policy has fallen through. He lived as if the king didn't matter. And he is going to pay the consequences for his choices. He has lived as one of the king's enemies. And we will see just what their fate is in a moment. But this verse may well be familiar to you. This is not the first time that we've read these words in Luke. They are repeated almost exactly uh, from Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Those words from Luke chapter 8 will appear on the screen, but please do flick back to Luke chapter 8 if you have a Bible in front of you, so you can see the context they originally fall in. And I'll read Luke 8, verse 18. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. Now these words in the first occurrence are related to listening. They are connected to the famous parable of the sower, a parable that's all about the word of God. And the big point there is that you need to listen to Jesus' words. Actively listen and you will learn more and come to know him. But if you don't listen like this, if you don't consider Jesus' words worth listening to, then there's a terrible result of losing them entirely. And we see just the same thing here in chapter 19, if you flick back with me. It's no accident that Jesus repeats himself here, and we need to connect the two parables together. In the context of this parable, of the ten miners, we can see that each miner is like the word of God. Notice how this is given to 10 servants, a big generic number, showing us uh, that this is the whole of the people of the kingdom of God. And then all the servants are given the same initial investment, one minor, the word of God, is given to all. And so the question is, what will they do with it? What will we do with God's word? Well, we see, don't we, some of them invested deeply in God's word. They multiplied it and faithfully worked it for the king who was coming back and they were rewarded. They were given so much more. And then there is the third servant. He's not considered the word worthwhile. Indeed, he's rejected the words of the king. He's held on to it. He's kept the word safe. It's like he knows where his Bible is. He takes it out at Christmas and Easter and dusts it off to kind of keep himself safe. But he doesn't really believe in the king. He doesn't consider the king worth the risk, worth working for and worth living for. Better to keep it safe just in case. His attitude to God's word is, is like an insurance policy. Just in case it is all true, just in case Jesus does come back, I better have something to cover my own back. But ultimately, this is faithless waiting and this kind of faithless waiting is hopeless too and it will lead to losing everything. As a third servant did, and as we see in the final striking words of the king, verse 27, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. 
king commanded all his enemies, those who had stood against him, be brought before him and killed. The king is utterly and completely victorious, and his words are proved totally true. Those who uh, have are given more. Those who do not have, even the little they have, is taken away from them. And that includes their very lives. It is a chilling end to the parable and a stark warning for us all. This rejection of God's king will not stand. When he returns, he will be proved to be the king once and for all. And all those who have stood against him will see him for who he truly is. And you don't want to stand on the wrong side of him on that day. Let's turn to conclude together. This parable is both a great encouragement and a great warning for people like us who live in the time before the king returns. It shows us very clearly the two options we have for life. We can live in faithful service of the king. That's going to be uh, risky and it will certainly be hard, but it will bring the great rewards of relationship and responsibility with him forever. And right now, that's going to look like listening to God's word. That is the investment that he has given us. Are you somebody who puts that word to work, letting it shape and change the course of your life with all the risk that that may entail? Don't miss out on it because it is worth it, as we've seen. The other option is that we can live in rejection of the king. We can choose to ignore his words, whether that's overtly like the delegation did or subtly as the third servant did. There is no insurance. There is no third way. Either you're in or you're out. And if you're in, then you're really in. And if you're out, you are really, really out. So let me urge you this morning, whether you're someone who trusts Jesus already or just hearing about him for the first time, be someone who is a faithful servant of Jesus. Take his word seriously. He has given it freely as a blanket investment to his servants. Invest in it. Use it. Work it for his glory. Have confidence that he will return because it is really worth the risk. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the investment of your word. Thank you that you give it to us to learn and use in your service now. Please help us be people who live our lives by your word, trusting that Jesus will return to be king and being prepared to risk everything holding on to that hope. Amen.